Good evening. It's wonderful to see you on this oddly warm early spring evening. My name is Joy Connolly, and as Provost and Senior Vice President of the Graduate Center, I have the privilege of welcoming you here. It's really a delight to see you here at the Graduate Center of the City Uni University of New York. And for those of us who are watching live stream, thank you for joining us wherever you are in your homes around the world. This evening marks the latest installment of our first 100 days programming. And this is a multi-part series designed to help us navigate the uncertain and, to, in the eyes of many, uh, treacherous waters of this new political era. Conversations over the last few weeks have delved into activism and immigration and other timely themes. They all feature Graduate Center scholars and other national figures. And we hope you'll come back for our event on April 26th, which is titled Trade, Jobs, and Inequality each of those things mattering a lot to each one of us. That these conversations are happening here is no coincidence at all. The Graduate Center has been and is an incubator of vigorous debate reflected in our doctoral and master's programs and the classes that happen here every day in our 30 plus centers and institutes that carry on research and activity outside our programs and the dozens of public events held here every week and above all, it's a source, the Graduate Center, of a steady stream of research, the kind that informs public life, that informs policy, and shapes the way we approach some of our biggest challenges. And tonight's topic uh, is certainly among them. We're doubly proud that this event falls under the auspices of the Ralph Bunch Institute for International Studies and the European Union Studies Center. Within the Graduate Center, the Ralph Bunch Institute engages in research and in graduate training and public education in events like today in the fields of international studies and contemporary global problem solving. Originally founded in 1973 with a strong focus on the United Nations and in honor of the Nobel Prize winning scholar diplomat Ralph Bunch, it was later given a broader interdisciplinary mandate uh, to support and strengthen international studies at the Graduate Center. The Ralph Bunch Institute draws not only on the distinguished faculty of CUNY and other universities and colleges in the metropolitan New York area and worldwide, but also on foreign affairs analysts and policymakers and practitioners in public life. In addition, it houses a number of projects, such as the European Union Studies Center that I mentioned earlier, that seek to improve the scholarly and public understanding of international affairs and to help solve related issues and problems. This evening's discussion that you've come here to hear tonight deals with such an international problem, the relationship between truth and power in our time. The topic is important to all of us as citizens, and is of particular relevance, of, of course, to those of us in the academy. It's also very much an international problem. As many of you will know, legislation by the Hungarian government has recently endangered CEU, Central European University, whose very existence is at risk because of ideas fostered there that its gover government deemed unfavorable. Well, we couldn't ask for a more impressive panel to take on this issue tonight, and let me introduce them to you. First, Masha Gessen is a contributing opinion writer to the New York Times and a frequent contributor to the New York Review of Books, among other publications. She's the author of the national bestseller, The Man Without a Face, The Unlikely Rise of Vladimir Putin in 2012, and her new book, The Future is History, How Totalitarianism Reclaimed Russia, will be published this October. Currently a Guggenheim Fellow, she's writing a book tentatively titled how to Destroy a Democracy, Five Lessons in Imagining the Worst, and a little, light, a little light shining on the topic, Some Notes on Resistance. Next, Jim Rutenberg has been media columnist for the New York Times since January 2016. Mr. Rutenberg was a chief political correspondent for the Times Magazine during the years 20, uh, 2014 to 2016. He served as the national political correspondent for the Times from 2010 to 2014, co-leading the Times daily coverage of the 2012 presidential campaign. He came to the Times from the New York Observer in 2000. 
Finally, Alexander Stilla is a journalist, author, and professor at the Columbia School of Journalism. He's the author of five books, including Benevolence and Betrayal, Five Italian Jewish Families Under Fascism, which won the 1992 LA Times Book Award for Best Book of General Nonfiction. He's contributed to many publications in the US, including The New Yorker, The New York Times, The New York Review of Books, and The Atlantic. And in Italy, he's a regular contributor to La, La Repubblica. Now I will turn things over to our moderator for the evening, Professor John Torpy, the director of the Ralph Bunch Institute for International Studies and a professor of sociology and history here at the Graduate Center. He's the author or editor of eight books and has recently written on Trump's foreign policy for the Hill and on Trump's election against the background of, quote, American exceptionalism, end quote. With that, I thank you again and please do enjoy the evening. Thank you, Provost Connolly. Can everybody hear me? Okay, thank you all for coming. Uh, before we get started, I, I have two people in particular that I really wanna thank for making this event possible. Karen Sander of uh, the Graduate Center's Public Programming and Patricia Nobe, who is the Associate Director of the European S Union Studies Center and a constant help to me. Um, this evening, we will address, as Provost Connolly has pointed out, the much-discussed relationship between truth and politics in our time, and not just in the United States, but as befits the uh, activities of the Ralph Bunch Institute in the world at large. Uh, Provost Connolly has mentioned that this is a problem in many parts of the world, uh, particularly in countries about which our panelists are expert. Uh, there is, of course, this ongoing issue of the Central European University in Hungary, which is quite close to our hearts because it's funded by someone who is uh, a New Yorker and it's basically uh, uh, established in the state of New York. Um, and of course, uh, recently, no, very recently now, uh, President Erdogan's extension of his powers uh, coming on the heels of a coup uh, after which he sacked many deans and academics. And when we first thought about uh, doing an event on this topic of truth and politics in our time, uh, I have to say that the three names that came to us most immediately were the three names of the people sitting on this stage. So we're very pleased that they were able uh, to come and to be here for this, for this evening's discussion. With regard to the program, uh, I'm basically going to ask them uh, a few questions for an hour or so. Uh, and then we'll open the floor for some questions, uh, but we plan to end promptly at 7.45. So thank you all again for coming, uh, and let me start by putting to each of you in turn uh, this kind of basic question, which is um, that many people have uh, said, found, noted that President Trump is uh, a brazen, un unrepentant liar, or at least a prolific producer of untruth. How would you describe his relationship to truth? I'm, not, I'm glad you laughed, but I'm not sure it's funny. <laughs> um, how would you describe his relationship to truth, and what is its significance for politics and democracy? So um, this is actually one of the areas where I think, oddly, uh, these two men, Putin and Trump, who are temperamentally so different, are actually quite similar. They, uh, they do use lies in very similar ways. And that is they use lies not so much to get you to believe something that's not true as to assert their right to say whatever they want when they want to. Right? Um, and if you, uh, you know, if, you, if, 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 if you think about Putin, he spent nearly two years claiming that there were no Russian troops in Ukraine. Uh, and they'd been photographed. They'd been, you know, they'd, they'd, they'd posted to social networks uh, from Ukraine. They'd come back dead from Ukraine. And yet he said they, were, they weren't there. And then he said they were there. He said, of course they're there. And at the moment that he said, of course they're there, that to me was the most interesting moment because um, he wasn't acknowledging that he had lied before. He was yet again asserting his right to say what he wants when he wants to. And I think Trump is very similar in, in that, uh, you know, when he talks about the millions of people who voted illegally or the wiretapping, um, 
of Trump Tower, he, you know, he, he's saying it to an audience of people who know that he's lying, and yet he's pointing out that he has a bigger microphone. And that, that poses a problem for us as journalists because fact-checking doesn't work against that. Fact-checking doesn't work against somebody um, who is, again, not primarily concerned with, having, with making you believe what he's saying as he is with his right to say what he is saying. Um, I was sort of struck by um, my background and my reason for being here is work that I did for many years covering Silvio Berlusconi, who has a similar, um, shall we say, elastic relationship with the truth that um, Trump has. And one of the things they have in common, which is very powerful, and I think people forget, um, in talking to and interviewing Berlusconi, which I only did once, one of the, but it, was true throughout his career, he had this incredible capacity to actually appear to genuinely believe the things he was saying when he was telling the most outrageous lies, things that were, if you knew anything and had been following it, you knew were simply not true. But he would say to you, no, look, you don't understand, the world is not round, it's flat. I've traveled one end of it to the other, in fact, I own most of it. And then you start to think, gosh, maybe the astronomers got it wrong. This Berlusconi guy is so convinced. Unless you have a lot of preparation, uh, it's very easy. We're not used to people usually. I mean, we've all interviewed politicians and they lie fairly frequently, but often they lie indicating they know the difference between reality and the truth, and somehow that's signaled to you. They understand that this is part of public life and, and exaggerating, spinning. Um, these guys are a way sort of anthropologically different, um, and that, I think, is, is one thing. Um, and in that way, I think that they are characters to go to the second question of what it means for politics um, is that they're both creatures of a particular age. I think there's, not, there's a reason why these kinds of figures have emerged at the moment in history um, when they have. And um, it is interesting, uh, this is not true of Putin. I mean, there, of course, fake news and lying on a systematic basis is not a 21st century discovery. This was an integral part of systems of government in the 20th century, mainly the, the two totalitarian systems, um, fascism and, and communism. It was not unknown to the CIA in the 1950s and things like that. But this is somewhat different, and I think it has to do with um, the change in the media environment um, of the last um, uh, 20 or 30 years. Um, I think it's interesting, for example, that Trump and Berlusconi emerged in the two major democracies where media was entirely, or broadcast media was entirely deregulated. Um, in the case of Italy, it was never really regulated when private TV began in the 1970s. Um, and in the US, I think people have sort of forgotten because it, it um, seems somehow like a couple generations ago, although it's not, um, there used to be something called the Fairness Doctrine, which governed broadcast media up until 1987. Um, and in the middle of the cable revolution, the Reagan administration, which was um, you know, pro-free market in general, said this is an antiquated rule, it doesn't make any sense in a world of uh, 50 channels or 200 channels. Uh, he had a head of the FCC, a man named Fowler, who said a TV is just to me and other appliance, it's like a toaster with pictures. And what I think they fail to understand is that television is different, um, that it is the, the reason why there was a fairness doctrine is that people understood that television was a huge force in terms of molding public opinion. And once we got rid of the fairness doctrine, you had um, Rush Limbaugh became syndicated nationally, I think the very next year. Um, then you had uh, Fox News became a national um, uh, broadcast in, in 95, and the whole thing changed. For those of us who can remember Huntley and Brinkley and uh, Walter Cronkite, it seems like looking back at the age of the horse and buggy, but the idea of this very sort of cautious, mild-mannered, on the one hand, on the other, other hand, sort of treatment of television uh, was really, really important to establishing basic parameters of what you could and couldn't say in public, you couldn't just make stuff up because they had armies of fact checkers and um, producers behind them. 
And the whole model changed with cable and with cable news in particular and Fox News especially so, where the whole thing was to get a niche audience and keep it. And so the louder, the more extreme, the more uh, provocative, the better. And we ended up in this world of niches because what Fowler and the Reagan people got wrong is that people don't, um, the, the notion was that with 50 channels there will be pluralism of information automatically built into a system with so many different channels. But that's not the way people watch TV or consume information. As we all know, we go to um, the sources that please us, that um, line up with our own beliefs, and now we're all in our own little information silos. And so I think that that is the, uh, to me, the novelty and the, the element that, that sort of um, uh, is the background to these figures and it's politically very, very corrosive because I do think it has um, greatly um, uh, aggravated the polarization in the country. It's, it's sort of ironic to think that before the end of the Cold War, the U.S. was known for being ideologically sort of wishy-washy. American voters were sort of all over the map. Um, and then you remove the great ideological conflict of the 20th century, and now we're far more polarized than ever before. So it's a, it's a very interesting um, paradox. So I think that's sort of the context to me of these uh, characters we're talking about. Jim? <coughs> and to pick up from there, um, I think that you, you take the, uh, the stripping away of the fairness doctor and the development of Fox News and talk radio, and then you put Facebook and Twitter on top of that. And now you have something we've never had quite before, which is where you can entirely choose your own, what I would say is kind of choose your own adventure. And Donald Trump has perfectly played into that. Um, so if he wants to make a claim about the illegal voters, someone who wants to believe that can find 20 sources through the internet, Facebook, Twitter, to kind of support and kind of hit that theme all day long and you can just live in that world where that's happening. And, you know, I remember um, in 2003 when the U.S. Um, killed Saddam Hussein's, one of his sons, or did they get them both, at, two at the same time? And I wrote about the, the U.S. strategy of having to sh present the bodies to the public because conspiracy theories over there were so preeminent that people would believe these conspiracy theories. Isn't that crazy? And yet here we're in the same place. Um, so, so really almost, uh, I think the most dangerous thing right now is the willingness of these huge and ability of a, a large segment of the population to live in these conspiracy theories. Our president pushed the idea that Barack Obama um, was a Muslim born elsewhere. That's, that, was his, that fueled his rise, literally. Um, so what does that mean for democracy? We'll see that the, sorry to say this, but for, as a journalist, the exciting thing is we get to see how does that play out in terms of getting something through Congress? How does that play out in international diplomacy or God forbid cases of war and peace? Masha, could you say a little bit about how you think these factors may or may not be relevant in the Russian story? I mean, I don't know, there was the deregulation of the media, for example, in Russia that led to Vladimir Putin's rise. So I'm just right. wondering. Yeah, I, I, you know, I don't think those parallels are particularly useful. I think that there are some uh, very interesting parallels between Putin and Trump sort of in, in, in very specific things like the way they use language, right? Or, or sort of the way they see themselves in the world, I think is very interesting. But comparing the systems is not very productive. I mean, there's a country with a 70 year history of, of totalitarianism and, this, and then you know, a decade of, uh, of attempting to, to, to build democracy, which is probably as different a historical legacy and as different a political culture as you get from the United States. So, um, you know, I don't think that's, ter that's, that's terribly useful. What I think that, can be, what I think can be a little bit instructive is the way that Putin has used media as his as his mirror, and that's that's the reality that he lives in. And it's fascinating to me that for him, in order to do that, you know, he had to take over television, and he's been watching Putin TV for 16 years, and um, and most of the country has been watching Putin TV for 16 years, um, which is not a good thing for the mind, but. Um, um, but you know, when 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 um, after the, the the invasion of Ukraine, when when Angela Merkel called um, 
Putin, and after that phone call said he lives in his own reality. And a lot of people thought that she meant that he's lost his, his, he'd lost his mind, but he hadn't, that, and that's not what she meant. She meant he lives in his own reality, the reality that he had constructed, and that he was very comfortable having reflected back to him. And I think that what we're watching here is that without having to take control of television, you know, without having to do uh, actual sort of physical violence or law enforcement violence to to a lot of the mainstream media, but um, but just create a bubble of your own um, choosing and live in it, and that's that's what Trump has done. So this raises the question about the relevance and, and usefulness in a certain sense of what journalists do. I mean, what is the usefulness in a context in which somebody is saying, essentially, I don't care what you say and I'll say whatever I want to say and some people will believe it because I'm president. Can I, I'll just hog the microphone for a second <laughs> uh, since I have it in my hands. Uh, but. Um, you know, I think that we're 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 coming up to the edge of a, of a false equivalence here, which is which is the equivalence between those uh, the what's become sort of a shorthand way of expressing our current condition, you know, the right wing bubble and the left wing <laughs> bubble. And I do think it's 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 a false equivalence, right? Um, I think that there's there's every indication that a majority of people in this country are actually routinely exposed to opinions that they don't share and do actually get answers to questions that they didn't ask, which is, which is what, which are, which are signs of health of the public sphere. And, and people who, you know, who live in the bright bubble don't, and there are fewer of them. And I think that, that the way for journalists to think about our role now is to think of ourselves as guardians of the public sphere. Uh, and there's a lot to be done there. It's difficult, but in some ways, and here I agree with Jim, it's, you know, it's more interesting than a, um, than a lot of what journalists had to do in this country for decades. Because to me, as, as a political, spending most of my career as a political reporter, I lived to debunk uh, bullshit, if I may. You know, that's, that's what you live to do. So now you can do it all day long. <laughs> no, uh, but it is vital, it is important, and there is a kind of renewed sense of mission that you know it's never been more important to make sure that for those who want to know what's really going on that that, that we're here to provide that and they, it's up to them what they do with that information um, i think that um one of the things that is um baffling about this um for the almost 20 years that i was covering uh, berlusconi to me, one of the sort of interesting challenges, and it's been renewed with Trump, is a sense of whether, I used to think that with Berlusconi, the kind of rules of political, the sort of Newtonian laws of political physics had been suspended. That normally, under normal conditions, um, a certain reaction provokes a reaction of similar force. So you screw up big time, you then pay a, a political price in terms of your poll numbers, uh, your popularity, you say a lie, you, you become uh, exposed as a liar. Um, those sort of things were, um, appeared to be sort of suspended where there was this person who could, by dominating the media scene as totally as let's say Trump has dominated during the last year, would completely change the way in which politics worked, in which um, what matters was who was covering the field, who was dominating and filling up the screen. And that seemed to matter more than what was actually happening and what was being reported on by more uh, serious media. And so in a way, it was a kind of test of, you know, the sort of Abraham Lincoln adage, you can fool some of the people all the time, you can fool all the people some of the time, you can't fool all the people. And for a while I thought, well, maybe Lincoln was wrong because Berlusconi keeps pulling it out and he's governed incredibly badly by almost every measure, GDP growth and all the rest of it, and yet he is like um, some sort of vampire that you, you know, you think you've got him in the coffin and out he pops again. Um, <coughs> and um, that, you know, uh, paradigm, uh, you know, sort of emerged again with Trump where you sort of wonder, um, does the reality principle still hold? And anyone who's in our line of work has to believe that it does still hold. There is some relationship, it seems, although it um, remains to be uh, tested in a real way between 
his approval numbers and things that he does, and yet there is a solid third to 40% of the country that um, uh, is behind him uh, regardless. And so I think that's a really big test, but I don't think as journalists, I mean, short of going out of business, you have to remain in the business of trying to tell what you think is uh, as close to the truth as possible. And I think it's also important, you know, one of the questions that came up after the election um, was, is the press the opposition? And of course, um, Steve Bannon and Trump himself uh, tried to portray the press as the opposition, and even within organizations like the New York Times, I'm sure there was an intense, I know from colleagues, there was an intense debate about, okay, what do you do when faced with somebody who systematically uh, tells falsehoods, and so how do you position yourself? And I, I personally think that it's very important not to lose one's cool too much, not to be a self-appointed opposition, which doesn't mean that you can't be very, very tough and call things as they are, but I think it's important, even if we don't reach the people who are reading Breitbart or uh, watching Fox News, that someone like that could read a story uh, that one writes and think this person isn't crazy or um, um, that they're making some sort of serious effort to um, to look at the whole story. And I think if we lose that, we're we're heading into trouble. I, I agree with that, but I, but at the same time, um, you know, and I feel like I almost, I was one of those who I was wringing my hands publicly about this. What do we do? You don't want to look oppositional. At the same time, our system set up an adversarial press. The founder set up an adversarial press, which to your point, you, it has to be fair and it has to give all sides. But um, so when a Steve Bannon says they're the opposition, well, like, okay, you want sycophantic, <laughs> you know, and that's not going to work for our system. It's not the idea. And I think that's um, one difference that the United States has from Russia, but you tell me, Masha, but um, is that it is, there's a tradition of this in this country, and it, there's law that protects it, hopefully, and um, even as much as people are turning their backs on the press and our opinion numbers, for whatever that means for news media, are low, um, this is something that, uh, that the people expect. And I don't even think would the most hardcore alt-right voter want to think that the free press was shut down. I, I just I can't, I don't know. I hope the answer to that is no. I mean, I can, I, I can, I can speak to that. I, I, again, I, I don't think the similarity is hugely, uh, I mean, the comparison is hugely useful just because these countries are so different. Um, one thing that I can talk about, though, is that, you know, I had the experience of spending more than a decade in an opposition press. And it is not a great experience. It can be incredibly exciting at times. But being uh, a person sort of under siege and um, and under fire all the time, or in the firing, uh, you know, the, the, the actually opening fire all the time, is not good for you as an intellectual, as a writer. Your your world gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and the number of issues on which you engage gets smaller and smaller. And that's why I think it's so important for us in this country not to think of ourselves as the opposition party, but to think to think of ourselves as guardians of the public sphere. Right? I mean. They are, in fact, attacking the public sphere. They're an existential threat to the public sphere. And in that sense, we're in opposition, right? But the point is not so much to dislodge Trump as it is to protect the space of debate that we have here. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think we are the opposition. We're, we can be adversarial, and sometimes we're just reporting the facts, and um, they can try to label it that way. But, you know, those labels, I think they're seeing the limits of their, those labels when they're governing, I think those labels work a lot better when they're campaigning. Well, these kinds of leaders are always campaigning. That's... Um, we talked a little bit before about comparisons. I mean, a lot of people are throwing out terms for Trump, some of which are familiar from European history, like fascist. Uh, and I wonder whether you would say a little bit about, I mean, you've been sort of saying some of these comparisons really don't make a lot of sense, but a lot of people are making them. So. 
you know, it would be interesting to hear you talk a bit about the foundations for distancing oneself from some of these terms. And you said you were thinking about starting a blog on Mussolini, Mussolini versus Berlusconi. And I think that's an interesting exercise. I mean, you didn't do it. It but. was, it was uh, half joking. But I think that um, what is interesting, and, and you might want to talk about the Putin comparison, I think that, um, you know, the, the parallels with Berlusconi were very, very clear in that in some ways it's almost uncanny. You've got um, a guy who is more of a salesman than a businessman, who makes a fortune in real estate, who then gets involved in the media, who has a bad comb over, who is a ladies' man who brags about his sexual conquests, who has um, a very opportunistic relationship with the truth, um, who is a billionaire, who has a kind of interclass appeal, who uses vulgarity and transgressive behavior to actually connect with common people, who develops a whole kind of political idiom. In that way, the, the parallelisms are, are sort of uncanny. Um, um, where I think it, it is interesting to, to think about it and where a more author thinking about the authoritarian dimension is maybe um, useful is that something that worries me uh, a bit um, is that um, authoritarian figures tend to be unstable in the sense that they need crisis. Somebody like Trump, in fact, is the product of crisis and he thrives in an atmosphere of crisis. And um, I think that's true of Putin as well. If there's not a, a war going on somewhere, he'll invent one. Because if the ordinary Russian were just worrying about um, getting to the end of the month and, and worrying about their decline, the de decline of the ruble, they'd begin to wonder why they don't have the freedoms that uh, they had uh, 10 years ago and things of that kind. So Putin needs a crisis. And um, uh, Trump, to a degree, uh, needs a crisis at all times. It's interesting, um, you know, that's certainly the, the Bannon side of uh, Trump, um, and we're all sort of playing guessing games about who really is influential in this White House and so forth. Um, Bannon has a kind of apocalyptic, crisis-driven worldview. Trump, it's not clear how much of that he actually um, uh, adheres to, but I think he does instinctively need crisis, and we hope that these crises are whether Jared is up and Steve is down rather than whether we are engaging in an atomic standoff with North Korea. But there is already early signs that because the domestic agenda is stalling out, that foreign adventure becomes um, a, an appealing way to change the conversation. And that uh, becomes um, worrisome. And so in that way, the <coughs> the authoritarian model and the Putin reliance on crisis uh, becomes something perhaps to talk about. Um, I think that comparisons across countries or across time periods <coughs> are sometimes useful and sometimes not, right? And uh, uh, they are, uh, they're great for sort of sorting out specific traits of a regime or specific traits of a, of a leader. In fact, I'd, I'd pick a fight with you about the use of the word authoritarian, but, um, but we can do it another time. But, um, but that's, you know, that kind of conversation is useful because, uh, because it gets you to focus in on details that you may not necessarily see when it happens to you for the first time. I think it's great for training the imagination. There are things that I can imagine that a lot of American journalists can, uh, who haven't worked in a country like Russia can't imagine because they have, uh, I've seen it happen before or I have seen something like that happen before and they haven't. Um, I think that the same way, uh, you know, there's a, there's a wonderful phrase that, um, that Tim Snyder, the, the Yale historian, used uh, when writing about Germany that um, <laughs> Americans are no wiser than the Germans were in the 1930s, um, except I'd add, you know, that we have a chance to be, because that already happened, and and you can, in fact, learn, uh, you know, not because uh, what's happening in this country now is exactly the same thing that was happening in Germany in the 1930s, or that happened in Russia 16 years ago, but because we can use the information we've accumulated and our imagination to see the danger that's, that's looming, and it's definitely looming. 
I mean, we've talked a little bit about the sort of background conditions under which Berlusconi and Trump and Putin uh, came to power, um, and that was mainly focused on the media. I wonder whether, uh, I mean, insofar as these media, these changes in the media have led to a situation in which people are kind of constantly drawn to things that they already believe. Um, you know, we're in an educational institution. Is this a failure of education in some way? I mean, one of the things that I constantly tell students is that the one thing they have to do is go out of their way to f find facts that, you know, are contrary to their own sort of predilections. And it seems to me it's fundamental, really, to what education is all about, because sometimes those other things that you don't want to believe are true are true. So I guess the question is, do you see... Uh, other broader preconditions for these developments? Well, I think just to, based on the, the kind of details of your question, I think there's been a collective failure in this country for sure. Um, and from my industry as well, what goes into real reporting? Why do we know this is a fact? Because there's been a decades long campaign for sure to paint not just the New York Times, but all mainstream media as the partisan liars. And we're not, obviously we, you know, if I, if I were a partisan liar, I could get to dinner as much as I want with my wife and I would have weekends off, right? Because you just make it up and you don't have to work. So letting people know what goes into this, why we, why we don't believe this, we know this, that's on us. And then on the education side, um, I think that obviously this is a thing now, like news literacy, it's a, it's a catchphrase. I hope that we take it somewhere for real now. Um, I would say that, um, you know, there has been, um, you know, there is some correlation between people's level of education and the sophistication with which they read information, and so there's some encouraging news for places of higher education. Um, uh, I think, though, there's also, you know, we need to look at um, uh, a larger issue, which is that you know, this particular moment that we're living through, which we might sort of think, you know, whether it's you call it populist or populist nationalist, is that it also takes place at a time in which a certain economic and social model that had functioned very well, particularly in Europe, but also here, um, is performing less well. There is an objective problem that uh, also is a precondition for the particular moment that we're living through looking at that carefully and understanding why that is not working for important parts of the population is something that perhaps uh, we haven't done enough of, whether in universities, in journalism. Um, and uh, that's a big part of it. There's a reason why France is flirting with the candidates that it's flirting with. Um, Italy is uh, in the state that it's in. Um, <clears throat> um, Poland is going arguably backwards. Um, so there's a broader there's a broader thing that that uh, we need to look at that goes beyond the media part of it, um, and that's part of uh, a, a general broader understanding of of a, a very peculiar and dangerous uh, historical moment we're living through, where a certain model that had reigned effectively for seventy years is in crisis, and and that I think is part of it. <coughs> I, I agree with what Alex just said, and uh, I think that uh, there is actually a useful comparison uh, between the current sort of worldwide crisis of, of dislocation and alienation and, and the early, tw early 20th century worldwide crisis of what Hannah Arendt called homelessness on an unprecedented scale, ruthlessness to an unprecedented depth. Um, I think there are also things that have happened in this country that we haven't interrogated sufficiently, and certainly that uh, th what has followed uh, September 11th, uh, 2001, the unprecedented concentration of power in the executive branch, the uh, unprecedented militarization of, uh, of government, the forever war that we have been in uh, against a thing that um, that cannot you know an, an, an enemy that cannot be defined to, for an objective that cannot be defined. I think that uh, the financial crisis of two thousand eight, which uh, was a, an existential blow to to a huge 
part of the American population that was dealt with perhaps uh, very well economically and not at all well psychologically. Uh, and um, I think that all of that created conditions for somebody to run for autocrat opposite someone who was running for president and get elected. Um, that said, I think that if you look back in history, there are many instances, not in this country, but in other countries' histories, when somebody starts running for autocrat in a, uh, in a functioning democracy and basically starts using the tools of that democracy in bad faith, and that force proves irresistible. And I don't know, you know, I think that, the, that looking for the preconditions is fruitful, but we also have to be aware that there are some forces that perhaps prove irresistible when they're used in, used in bad faith. And just on the preconditions uh, issue, um, just to make one more note on journalism, that goes to why the press can't be the opposition because what we need to be doing, and I think we are doing now, and what we didn't do during the election was understanding and bringing these issues to life, the, the preconditions that were there for, tr for Mr. Trump. Um, and that was a failure of journalism. I think it's being corrected right now, but just that's important to that last conversation. Okay. Um, I'd, ask, I'd like to ask you to do a little bit of prog prognosticating now. I mean, how do you see all this playing out in the kind of intermediate term, or is that a fool's errand? Is the, is the republic in danger? I mean, to some degree you've suggested, I think, that it is. Uh, how do you see that uh, sort of in the intermediate term, not in the long term? We can't predict that far out. But how do you see things playing out in the next you know, little while? I think it's a, such a terrible idea for journalists to make predictions. It's probably a bad idea for anybody to make predictions, but especially for journalists. Um, and I do think it's a fool's errand. Uh, I think we're in uncharted territory. I think that um, we, c we can understand what the dangers are by looking at what's happened in the past and what's happened elsewhere. Um, but we really can't understand what's, what, what's going to happen here. I think that uh, um, I have some hope. Uh, my hope is with s civil society in this country, which is certainly the most robust civil society anywhere in the history of the world, I think, uh, for some peculiar reasons, but, um, but it is. And you know, we saw how it can function in response to the, to the travel ban. When, when sort of the entire spectrum of civil society from protesters in the streets to professional civil society, which is the ACLU, comes out as though in a, in a pre-planned manner, which it wasn't, right? And, and makes the institutions function, you know, makes the judiciary function in the way in which it was intended, which wouldn't have happened actually without such a strong dis display of civil society. Um, so that gives me hope, and I think that um, the public sphere is actually quite healthy in this country, and that gives me hope. Uh, but I don't think I, that either of those things is a guarantee. Right. I mean, I guess I don't necessarily want you to predict, predict the future, but uh, I, I guess the question in a way is, is this a, a more problematic moment to be predicting the future than ever before? I mean, there's something about it that seems wildly unpredictable. So I'd be curious how you see Well, I mean, I guess my uh, feeling is similar to, um, in the sense that um, what we've seen in the short 90 odd days or whatever it is, um, is that I think many of us were worried that Trump would simply bulldoze over any opposition and that has not happened. Um, and that there is a, a, a greater sort of robustness to civil society than, um, you know, what was sort of alarming was to discover that, for example, there were no conflict of interest rules that applied to the president. And uh, a lot of us were sort of flabbergasted. You know, I spent years um, <coughs> telling my Italian friends, oh, well, this could never happen in the United States. Uh, well, no, there are not really laws over it, but it would never be accepted. And then I proved to be completely wrong. So um, no predictions. Uh, but the fact that there were other non-legal forms of resistance, as well as legal forms of resistance, um, that were actually effective in that, um, you know, why did the health care uh, repeal bill fail in the way it did it? In part because there was very, very strong public reaction, and that spooked a lot of lawmakers. Um, and so 
that in a sense is, is somewhat encouraging. Uh, again, um, I'm sort of of the view that, based on the idea that reality still matters, that the economic performance will be um, ultimately decisive in terms of Trump's, um, let's say, winning a second term. Um, that he has to deliver some goods to his electorate. That they're not, I think it's important, that, you know, they're not all crazy and they're not all stupid. And um, if he systematically doesn't do many of the things that he promised to do, I think there will be consequences. Um, and so, um, you know, looking at the economic program, I don't see how it can do many of the things that he has said it will do. It certainly is not going to make uh, the gap between rich and poor um, narrower. Um, I don't see how manufacturing jobs can come back on a massive level given the enormous forces uh, acting against that. So I would sort of cautiously suggest that we look at that terrain and how he succeeds or, or doesn't on, on that sort of terrain to get a sense of how it will work out. Right, because I think um, it, one of our journalists, uh, Matt Flegenheimer, wrote about this today, but his own supporters want to see what he promised, which was winning. And to win the promises that, you know, he made, uh, it takes, it doesn't take bluster, and it doesn't take a rally in Florida, and it doesn't take um, calling the media liars. It takes crafting legislation. It takes getting things through Congress. It takes convincing people. So to the extent that the will is there to win, it's going to have to be done in a different way for him, I think. Um, but on another level, there's something here and now that's playing out that is untethered from our sort of political process here, and that's international relations. And it was very interesting to be in Russia last week to watch this administration go head to head with the Russian administration over what happened in a chemical weapons attack on the ground in Syria. And when the Trump administration tried to make its case that indeed uh, Bashir al-Assad launched this uh, chemical attack that he was retaliating over, um, that when the Russian press and administration pushed back on that, the Trump administration tried to go through our press with leaks with you know, uh, intelligence, again, through reporting here, and the Russian answer to that was, but the, the press is all liars. You say they're liars, and you were right. And so now we're in this untethered you know, international debate. I'm not saying American credibility was in stellar shape after Iraq or perhaps other misadventures, but it wasn't quite here. So now we're in this unreal international debate, which doesn't serve our interests, and I don't think serve I don't think it serves his interests. Okay, thank you very much. I'd like to open up the floor now to questions. If you have, have a question, please come and line up next to, at one of the uh, microphones. Come down to one of the microphones. Right there. And we'll take a few questions. Please ask questions, briefly yes. stated. Yes, um, you, somebody fleetingly mentioned education, and I'm wondering how you view the war on public education as setting the groundwork for what's happened politically, uh, starting with Reagan when they started, uh, as far as I'm concerned, attacking public education by eliminating uh, civics classes, social studies, and the arts where a lot of the truth lies and being very patient and biding their time until I feel that it all kind of came to fruition where they have um, a, a good percentage of the population that just does not have the information that we used to get in public school where I grew up. Thank you. Anybody want to speak to that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'll take part of that is I don't know... I wouldn't speak to that in terms of outcomes of elections, but I do think um, that some of the denigration of education in general, Rick Santorum, if we remember him, the candidate in 2012, thinking it was, why do you need to go to college? You know, Don't let anyone tell you that. Um, you, there are critical thinking skills one learns through good high school and college, and um, you don't even see that critical thinking applied on our national cable debate. <laughs> I mean, it's like the rules of logic are gone. 
So I definitely think it's hurt, degraded the debate, the public debate, where you're not taught to think rigorously. Um, as for outcomes, uh, you know, and, and intent, I mean, um, because the opponents of public education say they have a better education system, so I just, I'm not as comfortable as maybe others on the stage questioning what their motives were, but there's an effect. Uh, hi. Uh, isn't it important to reach the hearts and minds of our fellow citizens who are in the bubble, or I like to think of it as the slow drip, uh, maintained by the triumvirate of Fox News, Right Wing Radio, and Breitbart? Um, and is there a role for journalists in that? If so, is there a role for journalists? That's a softball? I'm very, oh. <laughs> I think that's a hard know, how do we answer. reach them? It is a really hard question to answer. I don't, I don't know that, uh, I, I mean, it's, uh, it's impossible to answer no to that question because yes, of course, there's a role for journalists and of course it is important. Is it the most important thing to do? I don't think so. Well, my first question though, do we have to reach them? Should there be more effort about that? It seems like everyone now talks about they're in their silo, and then we all say, but they're not stupid or crazy. But then what? They're our fellow citizens, and they're in this almost cult-like situation, and you know, they are our fellow citizens, and it's terrible, I it's, think. It's, you know, it's very tough. Many of us are, you know, have close relatives who fall into that category, and um, yeah. myself included. And, you know, ma many have decided actually the best way to manage this is actually like not to talk about politics at all because they're nice people and I want to get along with them. And so I'm not sure um, how effective because when one does engage, you realize that they live in a completely different in information universe. If I cite the New York Times, they roll their eyes and say, well, of course you got it from the New York Times. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, so it's, it's very tough. I mean, I, I, I believe just on principle in the importance of civil dialogue. And if I thought um, one could have a civil dialogue on the O'Reilly show, I would go on, but I don't think you can. You'll just be insulted and humiliated and it will be manipulated. And so I don't think that is useful, but on the other hand, um, I do think where there are opportunities to talk to people in that world where y you can talk as we're talking now, um, yes, I just, I'm not sure how effective it is because I do think the reality is we are looking at a situation of deep polarization which is very unlikely to change anytime soon. And <coughs> I would just take a slightly different um, view of this just from a pure like day-to-day, -day, the job that we do in my newsroom. And I think there is something to be said though for saying where's my bubble coming into play as a journalist and what am I dismissing that is coming from, or what am I not hearing that's coming from, you know, the average Trump supporter whose anger I didn't grasp enough to realize which way this election was going. Uh, there was an interesting moment on our new podcast, The Daily, www.nytimes.com, no. uh, and the host, Michael Barbaro, was speaking to a coal miner about his issues. I don't know if people heard this, but it was a really great moment because the coal miner asked Michael, have you ever been in a coal mine? You know, and Michael had to say, well, actually, I haven't. You're making a good point. So I do think there are things we can do to reach a broader public and say, you know, we're good listening and we're trying to chronicle and tell your stories too. And that's definitely what my bosses will say all the time they want to do. And they also have said that in this past election, we did more of that than we get credit for, but we clearly didn't do it in the way that perhaps we should have. And that's something, I don't know where that gets anybody, but that's something. Um, you talked about the press being the guardian of the public sphere and uh, exposing um, you know, BS. But you only go so deep. There's some meta facts that the, paper, the media doesn't seem to cover at all. And that's the conning that goes on uh, that makes Trump possible. I mean, when you said that back in Reagan in the Fairness doc Doctrine, their excuse was that you felt they, didn't, they failed to see 
that, this, that TVs were not like toasters. I don't think they failed to see. I think they're very clear that this would help them uh, very cynically. And now that they're talking about making, changing the rules and neutrality uh, rules of the internet, perhaps there's something like that going on, thinking that maybe this could prevent the internet being used to counter whatever they want you to know, whoever is controlling uh, that media. I think you need to be much more cynical and not just present facts which do educate people, but go, there's an elephant in the room that's not being talked about that has to be understood. You talk about uh, censorship in Russia, but our representatives cannot talk freely or they'll lose their financial support to campaign. It's so expensive. So they have to censor themselves. So there's a lot going on sub Rosa that needs to be brought on the front page. I think I agree to an extent with what you, what you just said, and I th but I think I would reframe it as needing to write bigger stories. I think that there is a problem, especially in daily journalism, of writing about very specific things and sort of the minutiae of, of those very specific things, which is also hugely important, right? It's very much our job to do that uh, and to become sort of experts for a day in those things. Uh, but I think that what happened, uh, especially with the with this election <coughs> campaign, was that there was a real dearth of bigger stories, you know, about the... Uh, the kind of game that uh, that Trump was playing versus the kind of campaign that that, that Hillary was running, you know, which w would have been probably a lot more useful than some of the blow by blow uh, digests of the of the debates. Um, no, and I think you you have a valid point. I do think some people are doing that. I mean, Jane Mayer's uh, book Dark Money and her recent piece on uh, Paul Singer, who's a big um, financer of both uh, Breitbart and of Trump himself, uh, I do think there is a, a broader story about um, uh, the way in which power and media have functioned. Um, I, I think you're right that the, the changes, the, the, the junking of the fairness doctrine had a purpose to it. Um, um, and I think that, you know, for example, um, for a long time, I had a hard time watching Fox News. I've always felt it was a political operation. The person running it was Roger Ailes, who was a, a Nixon political operative and a political, everything could be understood entirely in political terms. What stories are they not covering? What stories are they covering? How are they spinning stories? It all was functional to a political design. I don't have any question about that. And so I, I, I do think one has to be careful to avoid a kind of false equivalence where you say, well, there's MSNBC and there's Fox News and it all, it all comes out even in the, in the wash. I do think there are very powerful forces, you know, Citizens United happened um, because of the political um, mix on the court and that happened because of the way the 2000 ele election fell out, which was, um, if it had happened on the other side, would have, we'd still be talking about it today as one of the great thefts of um, modern political history. Um, so there is a, a darker side to all of this that I think you correctly allude to. And I would just note that, um, you know, obviously we are proudest of ourselves when we break out the stories you're talking about and we get underneath <coughs> the campaign finance world and the, the influences that we don't see. That journalism takes a lot of time. You can't spin it out um, on a daily basis. And so that's one challenge um, which we pride ourselves in trying to meet all the time. Um, the scary thing is that the economics of our business are so bad that that's going to keep going away. It just right as of now. So that's that's one bad thing. Um, the other thing is that those which we don't care about, thank God, those stories do not click. You know, they're they are better campaign finance stories. Uh, with some except really heartening ex exceptions, they're not going to rise to the top of our most viewed list every every day. We don't care, but the pressure is there um, to care, and for some, they have to care. So there are a lot of forces against the journalism you're talking about. Well, then that has to be talked about too. We 
I, that'll be my next column. <laughs> or one a few later. Right. So it's great that uh, the GC is doing this and uh, I've read your books and I think your journalism is just absolutely terrific. Just tilt the microphone down towards you. Tilt it, tilt, there you go. Uh, just to say thank you to all the participants. Um, we like uh, to be entertained. We like sports. We like the give and take. If somebody says to Team B, you wear green shirts, Team B says, green shirts? Me? Green shirts? I don't wear green. So often the Democrats repeat the accusation, and maybe the media did a lot of that, repeating all the amusing things that Trump said which uh, a cognitive linguist whose name I can't remember said, is poison candy. Don't repeat the poison candy. Resist the entertainment value. Say, he said such and such. That is not true. The truth is this. As one of the useful techniques. The other thing is, yeah, the public. We have in this country an enormous history of nonviolence, the courage of the people around Martin Luther King, the great John Lewis, what they endured to speak what they saw as the truth. I think even the American citizens can take strength and be strong, but not in an adversarial way. That's the point, the nonviolent way. It's very hard when they're accusing you. It's very hard when they're leaning on you, whether you're a man or a woman, try to be nonviolent okay. and make your so points your that question, way. Your question. Not is, really a question. Just okay. A All comment. right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. <clears throat> um, I'm afraid I'm going to have to disagree with Mr. Ruttenberg um, when he said that you don't think that the alt right, uh, that the Bannons and the Peter Thiels of the world, that you don't think that the alt-right is interested in getting rid of the free press. I kind of see it as, it seems like they are really interested in getting rid of a free press, or the kind of the nihilism that you know, coincides with the alt-right. And what's worrying me about the kind of assault on the public sphere, um, I saw a demonstration of a technology pretty, actually you can watch them on YouTube, where they're able to um, quite convincingly, anyone who's you know, spoken in public at length, um, make videos where they manipulate, you know, manipulate, I guess they're using, whatever they're using to make the Can lips. Can we get to a question? The lips, lips occur. I'm, I'm question? wondering if, the, if this technology takes off over the next four years, what that's going to do to the public sphere, when you're able to create really convincing videos that make it look like any political figure has, is saying anything. Well, that's interesting. That is interesting, but before, I want to address what you said, though, about the alt-right, because, you know, you're, it's funny, as I said it, that's why I said at the end of that sentence, well, I hope that they care, because there is, there, ha, there was some rhetoric like the Lucan press, right, the Lucan pressa, you know, was an alt-right term that was going around, which would go to what you're speaking about. Um, what I was saying was I hope that if they c care about the Constitution, that ultimately they wouldn't be proud to be part of a country that doesn't have a free press, it's, so in, it's who we are. But you, you do have a point, which is why I tried to amend that at the end of the sentence. Um, as for your idea about technology, it's what, the, the technology could be used to, under, to what? To oh, just create more confusion when it, when it would come, you know, in, in upcoming elections in the same way that we, we were able to see kind of, see things be manipulated in the last uh, in the last few months, that's happening, right? And you know the 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 bots and the troll farms, um, they've had it. Arguably, I don't know what the electoral effect was, but they're in the mix. They were um, duking it out on Twitter, and that's a big deal. I think now that we're aware of them, there could be some some changes to address it. And I think that's where, which hasn't come up today. The technology companies are at some point going to have to decide, are they dumb platforms that are going to let anything happen, or are they going to take some responsibility for what's coming across their platforms to millions of people every day? Um, I would just add one thing. I think your point about the alt-right is uh, correct, and it's not accidental that you know Trump frequently refers to the failing New York Times. Uh, fortunately, thanks to him, uh, they've received a big shot in the arm after the election. But the larger point is actually an important one. If you look at the economics 
of daily newspapers um, that don't have, um, let's say, a Jeff Bezos who has billions of dollars behind him, as fortunately the Washington Post does. Um, the I, I think they'd be quite happy if all of what are referred to as the mainstream media just flat out failed for economic reasons. And that is not an inconceivable scenario. People have forgotten that reporting and gathering news costs quite a lot of money, and people have gotten used to information being free. Um, and so a kind of general scrum where anything goes and the strongest prevail or the most unscrupulous, those who are willing to manipulate the most ruthlessly could easily prevail. That's a, a realistic worldview. I felt like we were in that world for in uh, September, October um, of last year. And that does scare me. Um, and I'm not sure they would be um, mourning James Madison and um, um, quoting Thomas Jefferson about uh, the press if that were to happen. Um, so I think that's a very realistic thing. I don't think the society has had a serious discussion about what is the future of an independent press? How is it going to be paid for? What are the various business models and scenarios that will allow that to continue in perpetuity? And that conversation is not entered into the public sphere at all. I think also what, what you're talking about, I mean, that the technology of yet making politicians say whatever you want uh, is, is mind-blowing. But I, what I have observed, uh, we have all observed in the last few months, is the ease with which conspiracy theories take hold, not just on the right, but also on the left. And, you know, uh, I, I have had the bizarre experience of watching uh, some journalists that I like and respect and think are brilliant take things that I know a lot about and concoct from them the most insane conspiracy theories, uh, and you know, uh, and ha see their ratings on MSNBC go through the roof. Um, Can you share one? Yeah. An example? Sure. The uh, the connect the dots with the, all the Russians uh, that they ever read obituaries of, uh, and you know, including this one poor guy who died in Memorial Sloan Kettering after two years of battling cancer. And um, uh, none of those deaths, you know, the, uh, that were, and this was circulating for weeks, and it went, six Russians have died, seven Russians have died, eight Russians have died, and they're all connected to the Trump campaign. And no, they're not, and they weren't. Uh, and, uh, and people die, especially Russian men in their 60s. Uh, and <laughs> um, so, uh, you don't need super technology for that. What you do need, though, and I think this is this is this is what uh, does set sort of the current moment apart a little bit, is technology and is the ability to concoct all of this in a virtual space. And I think the answer to that is. Uh, to get out in the community, to go hyper-local, to interact with people meaningfully in person, to act in public, which also happens to be the only plausible recipe for saving the Democratic Party. So you can sort of kill two birds with one stone. Thank you. Uh, yes, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, one of the most effective tools, it seems to me, especially in the modern age against dishonesty and hypocrisy, is comedy. Uh, and comedy has prospered in the age of Trump. Uh, having taught political science for many years, uh, I was always disappointed, although maybe I'm not anymore, to see that many of my students got their information about politics from late night and other comedians. Uh, and if there's anything Trump hates more than the mainstream media, it's being ridiculed on Saturday Night Live. And so I, I wondered what you think the role of comedy um, is in, in, in fighting the truth for the truth. I would just say uh, an interesting, just an observation on that uh, question is when I started the media beat or the media column about uh, you know a little more than a year ago, um, Trump maybe longer. Sorry, like maybe 14, 15 months ago, um, I was I've always been interested in late night comedy and I was going to write about it and everyone was telling me Stephen Colbert is failing because what people want at 11:30 is Jimmy Fallon. They want a party. That's what they want. This was like the prevailing wisdom in late night TV. They don't want to hear the politics. They don't care. And that has completely flipped around. And Stephen Colbert is now beating Jimmy Fallon. Jimmy Fallon's in sort of a, his own existential crisis or how's he going to kind of survive. And so it just shows you that people are going to comedy in huge numbers 
and in a way that's a complete reverse of the trend a year ago. I have to confess, I'm actually really worried about this trend, uh, which may sound hypocritical because I just came here from yet another taping of the Samantha Bee Show, on which I've become a regular, uh, which, uh, which is which is one of the strange sort of consequences of this of this period for me. But um, uh, but I think that. Um, I have a couple of contradictory concerns about, about comedy. One is that in Russia, we actually saw how comedy couldn't keep up with reality because political satire usually works uh, by taking something to its logical extreme and thereby exposing the absurdity. Well, we're already seeing here that you don't need to do that. I mean, the Saturday Night Live doesn't take anything to its logical extreme. It portrays it exactly as it is. <laughs> And at this point, we think it's hilariously funny. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure how long lived that is, but I'm also a little worried about thinking that it's hilariously funny. Because there's something that happens uh, in autocracies, which is that language gets devalued and things get become laughable. And, and the 10th time you say nuclear holocaust, you can kind of sort of giggle and it no longer sounds like nuclear holocaust. And I'm a little worried about sort of going to comedy for an understanding because it's, all, uh, it's an understanding that comes with diffusing what's happening. And interestingly about Samantha B, she stepped forward several months ago to criticize Jimmy Fallon for having Trump on his show and mussing his hair and joking around with him, which, you know, but that was an odd debate to see in the comedy sphere. You know, I personally didn't quite know what to make of it because it's, this is comedy, so, um, and and another concern we could have about comedy too is that it's not news, and there are no consequences for actually accurately portraying it. And when there were all those stories about, um, this is where the kids are getting their news, it was like, okay, John Stewart, he's brilliant, and I'm a fan, but he doesn't have to follow the same, when he would be wrong about something or say, kind of forward something that wasn't true, he well, I'm just a comedian, I'm not, don't, hey, yeah, okay, I was wrong, so, it's a danger too that it's not, it's just not news, but it's powerful. Okay, thank you all very much. Uh, I think this has been an enormously illuminating conversation. Thank you all for coming. We look forward to seeing you next time.